Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 205, your guide to the Greek underworld. I am very excited to talk about this. We haven't talked about like solely Greek mythology in a very long time. And now is the perfect time to talk about it because of the video game Hades. Taking my timeline by storm. I love it. I love it. I'm all about people learning about mythology and getting really excited about Greek mythology for the first time since they were like 12 year olds who got really into crystals. I'm into it. Yes. As a a partner, Eric Silver has been playing through the game uh, many times. He will gasp and be like, oh, my God, my new buff is like this interesting sword. (laughs) And it seems like they take a lot from mythology. So I'm really excited that I got to learn about this uh, through this really fun and contemporary lens. Yes, I think you're going to really enjoy it, especially if you're like, I don't get what that's a reference to while you're playing the game. Don't worry. We'll explain it. Right on. Well, uh, before we get there, we have to welcome our newest patrons, Sam, Jessica, Zoe, and the Campy Vamp. What a (laughs) fun name. Thank you so, so much for using your hard-earned human dollars to support our podcast on Patreon. You make it possible for us to do this, for this to be our job, and for us to bring you a new episode every dang week. And thank you as well to our supporting producer-level patrons, Alicia, Allison, Deborah, Hannah, Jen, Jessica, Keegan, Nieselkins, Landon, Liz, Megan Linger, Megan Moon, Molly, Phil Fresh, Polly, Riley, Sarah, and Skyla. And those absolute legends, the people who support us every dang week, an incredible amount that I cannot really fathom, but we so appreciate it. Audra, Chelsea, Drew, Francis, Jack Marie, Lada, Livy, Mark, Morgan, Necrofancy, Renegade, and BME Up Scotty. Really ending on a strong note with these names. Really. I would run through the underworld for all of these people that you just named. A thousand percent. So Amanda, what you got going on? What have you been watching, reading, listening to lately? Julia, I just finished the newest uh, romance book by Courtney Milan, who is an incredibly uh, well-known writer in like contemporary romance. And I wasn't very into historical romance. I was like, I'll read like a modern meet cute, you know, modern rom-com. But I-, I wasn't super into this whole kind of subgenre of the like, you know, the corset buster, whatever they call <laughs> that. Um, it- but Courtney Milan, I think, really engages with but also subverts romance tropes, which are actually fanfic tropes for everybody else who has read fanfic and like it it comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And her newest book, The Duke Who Didn't, is a really, really great example of fantastic ways to like make a a love story that is about uh, POC and kind of Regency times in the UK. And again, like doesn't just sort of say like F this whole genre, I'm going to do something different. But it is such a delight in the way that like small tweaks to forms that we know really well, absolutely delight us, whether that's an unexpected ending or twist or whatever in a book, in a movie, in what have you. But um, it's a wonderful entry, I think, for anybody who wants to get into romance or readers like me who are kind of dipping their toes into historical romance. I really love your journey into loving romance novels a bit more. It has been such a fascinating ride for me as a an outsider. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that like society tells you is not worthy of uh, critical attention. But hey, they're wrong. Hey, fuck them. In other news, we would love to hear if you have questions for the gods and for just, you know, the universe in general. If you need advice, we're doing a new segment here on Spirits called Myth Advice. I mean, that's the working title for it right now. But you can send in questions that you would like advice for by going to spiritspodcast.com slash contact or sending us an email at spiritspodcast at gmail.com. It is going to be a lot of fun. I've started answering a couple of the questions in my notes already, and it is going to be a blast. With a, uh, a familiar but special voice. Mm-hmm. And we're very excited to uh, to be launching the segment. Cannot wait. So whether you are listening to this the day it comes out or in the far future, please send us your questions and we will get to them on our brand new segment. Ooh, brand new segment. Well, I cannot keep the good folks waiting any longer, Julia. So everybody, please enjoy Spirits Podcast Episode 205, Guide to the Greek Underworld. So 
So if you've spent any time on the internet lately and are around people who like video games, whether it's like in their vicinity in person or in on the internet, you have probably heard them shouting about a new game called Hades. So it is a dungeon crawl roguelike action game on Switch and on the PC, which follows the story of Zagreus, who is the son of Hades, who is attempting to escape the underworld, which absolutely sounds up the alley of our listeners and for me personally as a human being. So of course, it is a great way for us to have a conversation about the Greek underworld. It's something that we've referred to and that we've kind of had different myths and stories touch on, but we haven't examined it and like talked about its architecture and everything in its own episode. So I'm really glad we get to do that. Yeah, it's going to be an absolute blast. Now, I personally have not had the opportunity to play Hades yet because as we've talked about on the show before, I do not own a Switch. And I also have a lot of trouble like playing games on a desktop computer. So that's out for me. But luckily, we have a video game correspondent, Eric Silver of Join the Party and a frequent guest on this show. And he was able to provide me with a little context about the characters as they appear in the game and their role as such. So I'm going to be sharing his descriptions of each character in the context of the game before I dive into the actual mythology itself. And there absolutely will be spoilers for the game, just a heads up about that. So if you haven't finished it or uh, you mind being spoiled for endings and character development, maybe wait until after you finish the game. Just a suggestion. Maybe start Join the Party Campaign 2, which features all three of us and Brandon Grugel. It's a great time. It is. It is a very, very good time. In talking about Hades and the Greek underworld, we're going to be talking a lot about the Thonic gods, which is spelled C-H- T-H-O-N-I-C. The British pronounce the C-H. The Americans don't. So I'm going to say Thonic. Please don't yell at me, Brits. Wow. So I wanted to give an explanation of what the Thonic gods are right at the top. So a lot of times when we're talking about Greek mythology, we're talking about the Olympians. So these are the gods who rule from Mount Olympus and descended from the Titans, Cronus, and Rhea. And while there is some overlap with the Thonic gods, the Thonic gods are distinct in both their association with the underworld and the way that they're worshipped. So like it's complicated because worship is complicated and worship changes over time. So there are instances of, for instance, Zeus being worshipped as a thonic god, but as the same like iteration as Hades. So it's so Hades at some points is called thonic Zeus. So it it gets a little complicated and there is a lot of overlap, but I do think it is worth noting what the Thonic gods are before we dig into the underworld. So as happens with the Greeks, there is just, you know, a flexible definition of time, of relations, of consent. Yeah, we're going to see a lot of that in this episode, as we usually do with Greeks. You can't dive into ancient Greek mythology without it. So Thonic means in, under, or beneath the earth, like literally subterranean, and references the type of offering being made to those gods. So typically a nocturnal ritual sacrifice, where what was being sacrificed, usually a living animal, sometimes other things, it was placed in a pit and then either burned or buried. Unlike a lot of other worship of this kind in Greek traditions, though, the animal is left there for the gods rather than cooked and shared among followers. Hmm. So fun fact about just the worship of the Thonic gods. So we're going to cover a bunch of these Thonic gods in this episode, but I wanted to start with the main character of the series, Zagreus, because he is probably the god that our average listener knows the least about. So according to video game correspondent Eric Silver... He's never going to be referred to as anything else besides video game correspondent Eric Silver, full title. Ah, no longer the Game Master. That's to Charles, the Quiz Master. <laughs> That's for only quiz games. This is true. Eric Silver, the video game correspondent. So true, true. To quote Eric, the stuff that Supergiant said about why they picked Zag is really interesting. He's nothing. He's basically kind of Forrest Gump quality to him. He was there to fix a bunch of important Greek myths and meets many heroes, gods, etc. In regards to what Supergiant has said about him, here is a quote from Greg Cassavan, who is the director of the game, answering why he chose Zagreus as the main character for the story during a Reddit AMA. So, quote, there is a small scrap of poetry, edit, technically it's a play, not a poem, from S suggesting from the point of view of Sisyphus that 
Hades had a son called Zagreus. While Hades is a household name among Greek gods, nobody knows he has a son, and I never really heard of Zagreus despite being fairly familiar with Greek myth, having loved it since I was a kid. This was incredibly intriguing to me, and I found that there are very few myths about Hades besides the one well-known one about Persephone, which we've talked about on the show before. Episode one. So the idea of uncovering the truth about Zagreus and what became of him through this story was very exciting to me and my colleagues. Again, that was the quote from Greg Cassavan, who is the director of the game Hades. And it is uh, relatively true. Zagreus is a more obscure figure comparing to a lot of the other Greek deities that we'll talk about in this episode. Uh, his name means a hunter that catches living animals. The name itself comes from the word a pit for the capture of live animals, which is interesting when we talk about the Thonic gods, because that is typically yeah. how they were sacrificing their animals. But the role of Zagreus differs greatly from source material to source material. Sometimes he is considered the highest god of the underworld and is paired with the personification of the earth Gaia. As Greg Casavan said in his AMA, Aeschylus, the ancient Greek playwright, ties the name Zagreus to Hades, either as his son or as another title for Hades himself. But interestingly, the playwright Eurip Euripides, in a fragment of a lost play, talks about, quote, night ranging Zagreus performing his feasts of raw flesh, which do you want to take a guess as to which god might be tied to, quote, feasts of raw flesh? Uh, Cronus? <laughs> Not Cronus, but a good guess, honestly. Dionysus, who is also oh, a sure. character in the game. So Eric describes Dionysus as, quote, one of the gods who gives you power-ups. His thing is hangover, which slows and stuns enemies, of course. He's also a partying bro. Here's a quote from him. It's like, hey, there's Zag. Man, how's it going? Look, you have to get here with the rest of us already. We've been saving you a spot. Let me know what I can do. Make life a little sweeter for you in the meantime. I the voice actor does a way better job than I do personally, but it's fine. <laughs> so Dionysus, in case our listeners haven't heard of him, is the wine god and son of Zeus and Semele. But in the Orphic traditions, which basically were ancient Greeks who worshipped Orpheus and wrote poems about the beginning of the world, the history of the gods, etc., a lot of which predates the more classical tellings of the myths uh, that became prominent with uh, Hesiod, the poet Hesiod. So in these Orphic traditions, the name Zagreus is used to describe Dionysus, who is very different from Hesiod's Dionysus. In their poems and stories, he is the son of Zeus and Persephone and was killed and dismembered by the Titans as an infant, only to be re reborn later as the child of Zeus and Semele. So this dismemberment of the Orphic Zagreus is extremely important to the Orphic cult. So he was born after Zeus had sex with Persephone in the form of a serpent, which is important because a lot of the Thonic gods are associated with snakes. And when Zagreus is born, he is taken to be guarded as Zeus intends to make him his heir. However, as per usual, a jealous Hera intervenes, urging the Titans to attack and kill the child before he can turn into a threat. And after the Titans dismember Zagreus, they then cook and partially eat him Oh, uh, to the point where only the heart is left, which is then stolen away by Athena and given to Zeus so that he may be reborn. I feel like we have really different interpretations here of the sort of crown prince of the underworld. Mm. Like some of them are real, real like Zuko season two versus like <laughs> Zuko at the end of Avatar. I, uh, I'm just like many brooding princes, you know, are coming to mind when we talk about him. For sure. So as such, various sources refer to Zagreus as titles such as Older Dionysus, Ill-Fated Zagreus, Zagreus the Horned Baby, Zagreus the First Dionysus. <laughs> Horned Baby is my favorite. Imagine being a 40-year-old guy called Horned Baby. Yeah, Oh, uh, yes, sucks. the Horned Baby. <laughs> like, you walk into your hometown deli, they're like, Horned Baby, and you're oh, like, I yeah. have kids. I have kids. Give me an iced coffee. <laughs> so, ironically, there is a moment in the game where Dionysus and Zagreus are talking, and in reference to Orpheus, another character from the game, Dionysus says, quotes, that chap comes up with the most smashing song. So I was thinking, maybe we could spin him a tall tale, something like how maybe you and I, like, were connected or something. He'll buy it. Tell him. Tell him for me, yeah? <laughs> I really enjoy and Eric had been like reading out snippets of the game to me um, as he was playing through it. And it just seems like they have such a good interpretation or like such a good sense of world building. The characters talk to each other. They talk about each other to you. Um, and there is just a lot of kind of responsiveness and like a sense of the game knows what you've done um, and what you still need to do. And I think that's awesome and also so complicated with all the kind of like branching logic and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine the amount of dialogue some of these voice actors had to record. 
for sure. So what we know about Zagreus for sure is that he was the child of Persephone and that he was associated with the underworld and sometimes directly linked with Hades, either as another title for him or as his son, which makes sense for the game to use Zagreus as the son of Hades and associated with the underworld. Uh, Speaking of Hades and Persephone, we obviously talked about them in our first ever episode and the story of how they came together. So I'm not going to go into that too much. Just re-listen to episode one, I guess, if you want. But let's talk about their role in the game. So here is the description of Hades and Persephone from video game correspondent Eric Silver. (laughs) Hades is your dad that loves telling you you can't do shit. Rude. He is, spoiler, the final boss of the game who tries to keep you from going out to Greece on the border of the afterlife and the real world. He has two health bars and it's bullshit. You actually... (laughs) It's it's great. You actually don't know Persephone is your mom for a big chunk of the time. You think that Nyx is your mom because she raised you in the underworld. You slowly realize that your mom is gone and Hades doesn't want you to figure it out. Another spoiler. When you beat Hades and escape, you're out in Greece and you see your mom Persephone who thought you were dead. The Persephone-Hades myth is different in the game. Like, the gods on Olympus don't know what happened and they're trying to help Zag escape to live with them. It's a lot of secrets, especially because you don't meet Demeter, who has ice powers, see, winter, uh, until later on in the game. That's very, very cool. Yeah. So the game gives the relationship between Persephone and Hades a much more loving one than is seen in traditional myths and a lot of modern adaptations, which I love. What I love about one of the little details for the character design for Hades is his clothing and accessories are all very much covered in jewels. So he has these like large gem rings. His belt is covered in these large jewels. And that is because Hades was considered the richest of the gods. As king of the underworld and specifically all things beneath the earth, all of the gems found in the ground are his domain. All that good shit. It's so good. Also, as Eric's description implies, Zagreus spends the beginning of the game believing that Nyx is his mother. So now is the perfect time to talk about Nyx, the primeval goddess of the night. Let's do it. So checking in with video game correspondent Eric Silver, he describes Nyx as, quote, what a good hot goth mom. She gives you guidance and gives you clues to figure out your real parentage, but is always there for you even when she goes a little too far sometimes. She also is the one that gives you a massive mirror, the mirror of night, which you keep in your room and game mechanically is a progression system that gives you new powers when you trade in darkness, which is one of the currencies you get when you play. She is also the daughter of chaos who you stumble into to in your time in the game, more children having weird relationships with their parents. Nyx is one of the old primordial gods uh, who is said to have emerged from the dawn of creation. As Eric says, she is the child of chaos, who you also meet in the game, though some sources say that she is a contemporary of chaos rather than their child. She is the mother of Hypnos, who is the personification of sleep, Thanatos, who is the personification of death, Erebus, who is the personification of darkness. Dang. Nyx is a like wonderful and powerful goddess, so much so that sources, most notably Homer, say that she was so beautiful and so powerful that even Zeus feared her. But also Zeus mm. fearing powerful women is not a super surprising thing. <laughs> Fair. But openly fearing them might actually be a, uh, a sign of true power. That is. So she is said to reside in Tartarus and is sometimes shown to be a winged goddess who emerges from the underworld as like a veil of dark mists that draw across the sky and block the light of the upper sky or the ether. Uh, Nyx is the mother of a lot of deities, uh, according to Hesiod. Uh, mentioned Hypnos and Thanatos and Erebus, but she was also the mother of Eris or Strife, Nemesis, the Fates, the Dreams, and then her final child is the ferryman Charon, who we'll speak about later. Oh yeah, coin lad. Coin lad. So let's talk about the kids of Nyx, but first let's get a refill. Let's do it. So when I'm thinking about my hair care routine, Amanda, the last thing I want to think of is the idea that one size fits all because each of us has like unique hair and unique like lifestyles and functional beauty totally gets that. They are the world leader in customizable beauty, offering 100% custom solutions just for you. All you have to do is take a quick but thorough quiz to tell them about your hair goals. You can even choose the color and fragrance of the shampoo and conditioner that you're picking out, which I love. I did like a little lilac colored one and then like a really nice light blue for my conditioner. Next, the Function of Beauty team determines the right blend of ingredients and then bottles your custom formula to order. And then they deliver your personalized formula right to your door in a cute customizable bottle. They even put your little name on it. It's really, really adorable. I know. It's like, oh no, I'm going to get Jake his own so that his is labeled and he'll stop using mine because he has been using my conditioner lately. 
They also send you stuff like pumps and stickers and gifts and even detailed instructions describing how to use your hair care regimen, which I find super helpful because sometimes I just scrub my hair and wash it out. And I was like, oh, wait, no, I was supposed to leave the conditioner in for five minutes beforehand to get like primo results. And I I appreciate them telling me that. So what are you waiting for? You can go to functionofbeauty.com slash spirits to take your quiz and save 20% off your first hair care order. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash spirits to let them know you heard about it on our show and get 20% off your hair care order. That's functionofbeauty.com slash spirits. We are also sponsored this week by Calm. And we all know, I think especially over the last, um, I don't know, year, it has been very hard to sleep. It can be hard to put your mind at rest, not to think of the million things you have to do the next day or bad things that have happened or could happen. So I have been a loyal user of Calm ever since they started sponsoring the show several years ago. They are a mental fitness app designed to help you relieve anxiety and improve your sleep. You know about the sleep stories and the soundscapes that they have, but they've also got things like daily meditations and other ways to help you stay focused, whether that's trying to fall asleep or meditate and kind of reduce stress in your daily life. You should totally check out the stories read by Lucy Liu and LeVar Burton. They're fantastic. Yeah, here's a fun fact. I deleted all of my social media uh, apps off of my phone and the folder in which they were in, I just put my Calm app. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic. And uh, listeners, if you go to calm.com slash spirits, you'll get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming. Over 70 million people around the world use Calm to help take care of their minds and get better sleep, including the two of us. So go to calm.com slash spirits for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library with new content added every week. Yep, get started today at calm.com slash spirits. That is C-A-L-M dot com slash spirits. And finally, the other part of my uh, mental health regimen is better help, where I have a fantastic therapist with a very soothing accent, also named Amanda. She's wonderful. Better help is a way to get secure counseling done online. It's neither a crisis line nor a self-help system. It is therapy, but online and more affordable. And you have more choices because you can talk to anybody anywhere in the world and not just in your geographical area. They also really want you to make sure that you have a good match with your therapist. And I have over the last couple of years changed therapists a few times. So I really love that they make it easy and also free to change counselors if you need to. Definitely not how it works offline. Yep. So if you want to visit their website and read testimonials from real users and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional, you can go to BetterHelp, betterhelp.com slash spirits to get 10% off your first month of counseling. Use BetterHelp, start being happier today, and go to betterhelp.com slash spirits for 10% off your first month of counseling. Awesome. And now let's get back to the show. So, Amanda, I found a incredible cocktail that I wanted to share because, y'all, it's called The Underworld. Basically, uh-huh. it is tequila, lime juice, creme de cassis, which is a black currant liqueur topped with ginger beer. So, like, it's a little bit smoky, a little bit peppery and herbal. And I'm in love with it, just like I'm in love with the Greek underworld. It tastes like my semester abroad in London, which was uh, Ribena and Dark and Stormies only. Incredible. So very good. Yep. All right. So with these in hand, let's talk about Nix's kids. We will start with Hypnos, who video game correspondent Eric Silver calls, quote, what a sleepy bitch. LOL. He loves... (laughs) He loves to tell you how you died. What a jerk. He's known as super lazy and always sleeping, which honestly fair because he is, after all, the embodiment of sleep. In most stories, Hypnos is said to live in a cave at the mouth of the river Lethe or Forgetfulness, which is one of the rivers of the underworld. We'll talk more about those later. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. If you look at the art of Hypnos in the Hades game, you'll notice that he has two red poppies adorning his belt. Poppies were one of the symbols of Hypnos, and it was said that a field of them, as well as other hypnotic plants grow at the entrance of his cave. Overall, most stories about him are pretty chill. He's a pretty chill god, and he has a strong affinity for humans and helping them out since they spend half of their life dreaming. He is married to one of the graces named Pasithea, whose name makes sense because she is the deity of relaxation and also hallucination. Basically, he's married to the goddess of really good trips, which I absolutely love. It's fantastic so good i've been watching a lot of gilmore girls and it reminds me of babette not exactly the same but 
similar energy. And I it, I think Gilmore Girls fans will agree with me. Yes. Love that sleepy bitch. So his twin brother is Thanatos, who we're going to talk about next. So checking back in with video game correspondent Eric Silver on Thanatos, he says, quote, he's basically the ship for Zag. He disapproves of Zag trying to escape like the stuck up love interest to your chaotic, angry Zag. There are some levels where you compete against Than to see who can kill the most monsters in a level. If you beat him, he gives you 25% health, which is awesome. Very good. Yeah. So, hey, fun fact. Hades, uh, you get two characters that you can romance, one being Thanatos, and then we'll get to the other one a little bit later. But more importantly, Thanatos is the personification of death, which people confuse him with Hades fairly often. But to clarify, Hades is the god of the dead and ruler of the underworld. The dead come under Hades' domain after they die, where Thanatos is literally the personification of death. He brings death to mortals and gods, sometimes acting as a guide for the dead, though sometimes that role is taken over by Hermes, the messenger god. Uh, Thanatos is sometimes specified to be the god of peaceful death with the bloodthirsty Charis embodying violent death, but it, it's rare that that specification is made. Uh, but because of this, he's often shown in contrast to his twin brother, Hypnos, like t- we saw earlier. I mean, death is the the deepest sleep, right? So that makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, he is usually represented by the butterfly, which shares the same word for soul in ancient Greek or life and uh, or he's associated as well with the poppy same as hypnos cool very cool what if a butterfly lands on a poppy Julia will I then immediately fall asleep and then die yes yes you would no no (laughs) every time uh, I gotta get my stardew farm in order I'm growing so many poppies right now every time a butterfly lands on a poppy someone (laughs) dies Oh, no. I mean, it's probably true, all things considered, but... <laughs> it's the, it's like the shitty version of every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. <laughs> uh, moving on from some of the screenshots that I've seen of the game, I know that Charon is the, like, merchant NPC of the game that you can buy items from, which makes sense given in Greek mythology he is the ferryman for the souls of the dead to take them across the river Styx. And of course, as a ferryman, he needs to be paid. So the Greeks would... Point lad! <laughs> the Greeks would bury their dead with a coin in or on their mouth, and that was specifically known as Charon's obol, O-B-O-L. Uh, as such, it would make sense for Charon to be rolling in coins and currency in the game, uh, but here's some of the stuff that I didn't know from video game correspondent Eric Silver. What a good non-speaking lad. So you had, I told him what I knew already, so he continues, so you had most of the stuff about Charon right, but you can also fight him. Sometimes a bag of money appears behind Charon, and you can, quote, quote, borrow 30 gold. And if you do, Charon will send Zagreus to a room in Erebus filled with his treasures and four tall golden jars and then tries to kick your ass. Nice. Which is very good. Don't steal. Don't steal from the ferryman. He's just a nice guy. I'm just thinking, too, that that practice of burying people with coins must be super helpful to uh, archaeologists who are like, oh, great, a way to definitively date this body. Yes, yes good. Uh, it's not just the Greeks that did this. There's a bunch of different cultures that would bury their dead with some sort of gold or payment for Uh, traveling to the afterlife. Uh, Charon's name comes from the Greek word for keen gaze or flashing eyes, which may or may not be a euphemism for death. It's uncertain. (laughs) Uh, We're going to get into what Erebus is later when we kind of give a breakdown of what the underworld actually looks like. But first, we have to talk about the Furies. We sure do. I I did just want to say that I think keen eyes um, sounds like a great euphemism for gay. (laughs) Fair enough. Yeah. Your Uncle Jimmy has some keen eyes. (laughs) It feels like the name of a like early 2000s punk band. Keen eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bright eyes, right? It's so good. So the Furies are also known as the Ironies and not like irony, but like it's spelled E-R-I-N-Y-E-S. And they Mm. are made up of, according to Virgil, three sisters. There's Electo, meaning endless, Tisiphone, meaning vengeful destruction, and Megara, meaning jealousy. And much like Thanatos, Megara is another romanceable character in the game. A video game correspondent Eric Silver says, Meg! At one point, Meg said something like, it sucks working for your ex-boy friend's father and your ex-boyfriend keeps making you look bad to your boss implying (laughs) that 
they've had a relationship in the past, interestingly. She is the boss of the first level, Tartarus. Eventually, her sister, Electo, who sucks and calls you red blood, and Tisiphone, who can only say the word murderer, lol, step in instead. Uh, I have seen the art for Megara. She is hot. In the game, she works for Nyx rather than being a daughter of the Night Goddess. Uh, the name might sound familiar, but she is distinctly separate from Megara, the wife of Heracles. The Furies were in the Iliad and were called, quote, those under earth take vengeance on men, whosoever hath sworn a false oath. And their name comes from both the noun meaning strife and the verb meaning to raise, stir, or excite. Like, I know there's obviously misogyny kind of behind the idea that like a, a shrewish, like actual harpy, you know, will will sort of come on you and, and hold you to your promises the way, I don't know, a reasonable spouse might if you, <laughs> I don't know, cheat on her. Um, but I... I do love this image so much. I love the image that you that uh, Oathbreakers, you know, are surrounded by like a I mean, in my mind, they're very kind of like bird um, aesthetic mm -hmm. and a, a bunch of like winged, you know, goth harpies. Yeah, I, I also like that. They were said to hear the complaints brought by mortals where the societal structure was broken or like the societal contract was broken. Uh, so like when the young were rude to the old, when hosts are rude to guests, when children go against their parents. Interesting. Yeah. That's really much better is. than like, this is what we do because we're in a society. <laughs> Yeah, it's very much like lawful neutral or lawful evil is a good way to kind of uh, look at the the Furies. But when they are found to be broken, the Furies then hound the culprits relentlessly until they are, as the Greeks would say, driven to madness or die from the torment. Specifically, Electo was said to punish moral crimes, like kind of like the deadly sins style stuff. Right. Uh, Tisiphone punishes murderers, hence why she can only say murderer, according to Eric. Incredible. And Megara punishes oathbreakers, thieves, and those who are unfaithful. Cool. I mean, listen, that's all we have, right? Is like our word to each other. That is, yeah. society is a very tenuous promise that we all grow up having already made by having been born. Yeah, the societal contract to the Greeks was extremely important. So to have like these vicious women kind of enforcing it is is such a fascinating imagery also reminds me i'm sure any other uh, high school debate kids raise your hands um Whenever no. we were in, whenever we were in a debate, you had to like establish the parameters of debate. And I wasn't particularly like I wasn't taught like the classics. So all these like, you know, bros from private schools who knew all about like, oh, yes, well, Rousseau versus Hobbes versus Locke, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, the only thing I knew to reference on the fly if I had to was the social compact. <laughs> I was nice. like, well, John Locke's the social compact tells me that um, um you're wrong. <laughs> and it was you have to like be my, nice to me because the social compact. <laughs> my ace in the hall is very good. That, yeah, honestly, a very good one. I love it. So uh, one last character before we get into the layout of the Greek underworld, and it is perhaps the most important character in the game, in my opinion, as someone who has not played it. And that, Amanda, of course, is Cerberus. <laughs> Love this lad. So according to video game correspondent Eric Silver, who agrees with me, he says, the best dog in the world. You can pet him and give him treats and tell him he's great. Cerberus is the main obstruction in the last level Temple of Sticks. Cerberus guards its exit, but you don't have to fight Cerberus, thank God. Zagreus must find a satyr sack, which is a sack of satyr meat and Cerberus's favorite snack as a bribe <laughs> to leave the area. Only then can you go to the surface and fight Hades. And as we know, Amanda, from our many times talking about Cerberus, he is very susceptible to snacks, usually cake yes. in Greek mythology rather than satyr meat. But obviously, a pup is going to want some meat, so I don't blame the game developers. You know, sometimes no. you just got to give them like a little like a Slim Jim worth of satyr meat. <laughs> Uh, and of course, because Cerberus is a guard dog, it makes sense for him to be the final obstruction of the game before you pass out of Hades, as he is supposed to stop the living from coming in and the dead from leaving. What a good lad. Eric uh, just turned around the switch to show me Cerberus when he came on screen. And he's like, boy. Amanda, your son. Yes. <laughs> Uh, good spot. What a good lad. Uh, but now let's talk about the underworld, also known as Hades in the physical sense. Uh, Eric explained that in the game, there are four levels of the underworld. There is Tartarus, Asphodel, Elysium, and the Temple of Styx, which is some but not 
all of the levels of the actual Greek underworld. Uh, important to the underworld, as someone who has played the game will know, is the rivers of the underworld being extremely important, not only to the underworld, but in Greek mythology as a whole. Doing a quick rundown of the six main rivers, there are the Styx, which is probably the most important. It is the river of hatred and circles the underworld seven times. Same. There is the Acheron. <laughs> Same, uh, which is the river of pain, and that is the one that Charon ferries the dead over. There is the Lethe, which we talked about with Hypnos, is the river of forgetfulness. The Phlegathon, which is the river of fire, which emerges out of the depths of Tartarus. The Cocytus, which is the river of wailing. And finally, Oceanus, which is the river that encircles the world and marks the most eastern edge of the underworld. A lot of rivers. I didn't know there was more than one river in Hades. Yeah, you would think it's just sticks from the amount that we talk about it, but there's several yeah. of them. Also, is it, I mean, I know we kind of refer to the underworld as Hades in vernacular. Is that right? Or yes, is that just kind of like, okay. Yes, Good. it is used both for the physical place and the name of the god that rules over it. Nice. Yes. I didn't want to be improper here. No, I appreciate you asking. And I'm happy to answer because I knew the answer. Yay. Love when that happens. <laughs> So Tartarus or the pit is next up. It is so deep in the earth. Sources say that it is as deep in the earth as the sky is high above the surface of the earth. Wow. So very, 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 very deep. <laughs> Yeah. This is where Zeus imprisoned the Titans after they were defeated by the Olympians. And Homer claims that some of the worst people in the underworld are sent to Tartarus to be punished by the Titans for their misdeeds. Like many of the places in the underworld, it is both a place and a deity, the deity being one of the primordial beings alongside Chaos and Gaia. The game also talks about Erebus as a place, though it is also a god, the sibling of Nyx and a child of chaos in Greek mythology. He is the personification of darkness, whereas Nyx is the personification of the night. The term also in Greek refers to, quote, the place of darkness between Earth and Hades, though it is still not a place in the underworld, but again, an embodiment of the physical aspect of the primordial being. Uh, confusingly, some Greek literature does make the different distinction, saying it is a region of the underworld where the dead pass into immediately after dying, while others use it interchangeably with Tartarus. Honestly, there's a lot of this in Greek mythology, a lot of a thing being the literal embodiment of a thing, while other times it's a god or a concept or a place, and it's, it's just a little confusing because, again, there's been so many different versions of these stories told and so many variations in different kinds of worship over the years, so... Yeah, and it's a thing that we love to say just in kind of poetic speech, you know, like you'll say like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, they were chaos incarnate, right? Like you or, you know, they embodied whatever. And when you're talking about beings that literally make or made or are those things, I think we're allowed a little bit of kind of linguistic slippage, you know? Okay, good. That's something at least. Uh, next up, there is the Asphodel Meadows, which is sort of like the place where ordinary souls go. These are people that- Are you sure that's not like a golf course in Queens? It does sound like it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is where like people who didn't really commit any horrible crimes or misdeeds, but also didn't really achieve greatness or recognition. Oh, <laughs> oh brutal. It's kind of like in the good place where there's the medium place. It's like that. Right. There's also the mourning fields, which are for those who died feeling as though they wasted their lives or died with their love unrequited. Uh, there is oh, a shit. lot of these in Greek mythology, unfortunately, and it's almost exclusively full of women, which is not great, to be honest. Uh, so we're going to get out of here. and We're going to talk about Elysium instead. <laughs> great. So Elysium is the place of the distinguished souls. So these are the ones where like they're either heroes or demigods or people who lived their lives purely and righteously. Uh, for instance, Socrates, despite not being a hero or a demigod, is said to reside in Elysium after he died because of his great accomplishments in philosophy. Uh, this is also like where heroes like Achilles and Peleus are said to reside in death. There is one final place contained within Elysium, which is known as the Isles of the Blessed or the Fortunate Isles where souls that were granted entrance into Elysium were sometimes given the option to be reborn. Uh, and if they were reborn three times and lived lives worthy of Elysium each time they lived, they were then sent to the Isles of the Blessed, basically like the, the best place to reside in in the afterlife, the like best place. That really feels like a video game, you know, uh, mm -hmm. where you think that you achieve it, but then it's like, oh, no, 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 you have to do that again three times perfectly. And then you get to go to the final place. Yes. It's like, ah, uh, okay, well, if you beat the game in expert mode three times, then you get this cool bonus feature. You also just like unlocked in me 
like memories of being in like middle to late high school and reading, you know, like Yates and Keats and and like all these um Byron and all these fucking guys who like went to college learning <laughs> Greek and Latin and we're like oh yes the Elysian fields and you know if you don't look up every fucking reference these people make to Greek and Roman mythology you like miss out on half the meaning or if you don't just happen to know the Bible back to front you know you're gonna miss like uh quotings or paraphrasings or references and I think Julia it's all pretty bullshit man <laughs> you're just like who the fuck is Jove and why do they keep saying by Jove? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, so lastly, I want to talk about the weapons in the game because I know it's an important aspect to your strategy and gameplay. So in the game, there are six weapons that you can unlock, each of them apparently being a weapon that was used by one of the Olympians during the battle with the Titans. A lot of these are not super accurate. I'm not going to lie to you, but I'll break down the interesting aspects of each of them and kind of how they tie to mythology. So first up is the Stygian Blade, supposedly used by Poseidon and named after the river Styx, Stygian meaning of Styx. There are two aspects of the Stygian Blade, which I would like to point out. One of them is associated with the goddess Nemesis, who is the goddess of retribution and revenge, and it deals like bonus critical damage, which makes sense given its namesake. The final hidden aspect of the sword is linked to King Arthur, which is where the developers kind of start dipping into other mythologies. Like, obviously, King Arthur is associated with another blade, the Sword of Excalibur, and it's like whole tied up into the Christian mythos and his search for the Holy Grail. So the fact that one of its moves is called Hallowed Ground shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, but... It's it's interesting. I just see that as kind of an interesting nod, you know, like by the time you're kind of making your way into different aspects of the weapons, um, you know, you're you're pretty into mythology or at least know enough of it that you can be like, oh, yeah, no, it's tight. Well, don't worry. They do that for all of the weapons. <laughs> I think that's OK. I think yeah. it's OK. I don't think it's I don't think it's wrong. I think some of them are a bit of a stretch, though. We'll see. So next okay. up is uh, Varatha, which is the eternal spear and supposedly the weapon used by Hades. Hades isn't typically known to use a spear, but interestingly, Varatha is a spear that has two points, which is interesting because Hades is sometimes depicted carrying a bident or a two-pronged pitchfork. Ooh. Mm, interesting, right? So the name Varatha comes from the Tamil word for do not come in or Varathan, which means outsider, which is fitting as Hades is kind of separated from the rest of the Olympians after the fall of the Titans. The other aspect of Varatha ties the weapon to Achilles, who is also seen with a bifurcated or divided into two spear. So it's, it's like, you're like, oh, there's people who are actually using this kind of weapon, which is interesting. And at least they tied that to the right people this time. Bident is the preferred gum of bisexuals everywhere. <laughs> oh, fuck you. That's very funny. I'll take it. <laughs> the final secret aspect is tied to the deified Chinese general Guan Yu, who is associated with kind of like loyalty and righteousness and is also said to have invented the Guan Diao, which is a pole weapon similar to a spear. And Guan Yu's Guan Diao was known as the Green Dragon Crescent Blade. Incredible. So that's a good tie. I like that one. I'm into that. Then there is Aegis, which is the Shield of Chaos. This was Zeus's weapon in the war against the titans and does actually for once have a direct tie to a mythological weapon of the same name this was a also a pokemon julia Aegislash yes. slash is the steel ghost type pokemon introduced in generation six so this was a goat skin shield sometimes depicted with the head of a gorgon and was used not only by zeus but by athena as well uh, the game ties one of the aspects of the shield to the primordial being chaos who in the game mentions using it to spy on the gods which i think is really interesting and something very chaotic which makes sense yeah sometimes you're like oh yeah th that is what this uh concept that we encounter all the time in life is named after yes that makes sense <laughs> the hidden aspect is tied to beowulf which is you know the the infamous danish hero from the old english poem the assumption i can make here is that beowulf is usually shown as like a heroic figure who went into battle to protect others which i guess would associate him with a shield but i think it's a bit of a stretch like he's shown you using a shield but it's not like his shield was like infamous and usually when he was in battle he was like tearing off the arms of things rather than being like ah oh, yes i hit him with my shield like captain america uh so the next weapon is the chronoct which is the heart seeking bow and is the weapon of hera because my favorite donut ever made my favorite food trend of the late 20 teens 
Is it the heart seeking bow? <laughs> the cronut. Oh, the chrononaut. Aha, uh-huh, I get yeah. it. I got it. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this is the weapon of Hera because obviously it's always the woman who gets bows. And I can go on a tirade about women very rarely getting good, like, up-close martial weapons. But that is a story for another time and another complaint. Uh, The name seems to come from the Gaelic word koronak, which means funeral song. I probably pronounced that wrong. I apologize. And the aspects tied to the weapon are Hera and Chiron, the centaur trainer of heroes who is often depicted as wielding a bow and arrow. Uh, The hidden aspect of this weapon is Rama, who is the avatar of the god Vishnu in Hindu religion. Rama is strongly associated with the bow and arrow, often being depicted with the arrow in his right hand and the bow in his left. Right on. Really mixing it up with these mythologies. Love it. Uh, Next up is the twin fists of Malfon, said to be used by the goddess Demeter, which now we're talking with some close-up combat for a woman. The name doesn't really mean anything. You can kind of like roughly in Greek get something close to bad voice, but the weapon is said to encourage fury and rage while also engulfing them in like primal strength. Besides Demeter, the weapon is tied to Talos, who in Greek mythology was a bronze giant who in some stories was interpreted as like an automaton or a robot. Uh, Hesiod's version of the stories from the Bronze Age portray like men from the Bronze Age as being literally made of bronze. Another good Spirits Back catalog pick is a uh, video game correspondent Eric talking about golems, which is one of my favorite of all time. Absolutely. In other stories, he was made by the forge god Hephaestus and given to Zeus as a protector for his lover Europa. The secret aspect of the Fist of Malfon is our boy Gilgamesh, who, as you know, has pretty close ties to the underworld and Sumerian tradition. Sure does. He's not afraid to get into a little bit of hand-to-hand combat. About. Sure wasn't, Julia. Wasn't sure dope. wasn't. It's a lot of very masculine wrestling and throwing of bulls of heaven and it's a whole thing. Some pining. Yep. Lots of stuff. <laughs> so finally, there is the exagriff, which is the adamant rail, which is just like an eagle gun. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> This one was wielded supposedly by Hestia, you know, Hestia, the goddess who rarely gets into any sort of trouble and spends most of her time at the hearth of Olympus minding her own goddamn business, Hestia. Okay, fair. Adamant uh, is unsurprisingly the hardest of all substances in Greek mythology. It's supposed to be like harder than steel and diamond. So the name Exagriff probably comes from the fact that Hestia is the sixth child, Exa meaning six, and Griff as in like griffin or flying creature, which kind of makes sense with the eagle head. And also because like the the shots are flying creatures. I don't know. This one's a bit of a stretch. Again, I'm just like, uh, okay, he gave them a gun. Cool, I guess. I just think that the first company to actually establish high-speed rail in the U.S. should be called Adamant Rail. Yes. Yes, they should. Agreed. 100%. Right? Like, fuck you. We need good public transportation. We really do. Please. Please, we beg of you. Give us high-speed rail. So the next aspect is Eris, who is another goddess associated with this weapon, which totally makes sense because she's the goddess of strife and probably the most well-known for kicking off the Trojan War. So giving her a gun kind of makes sense. In a way. Yeah, sure. And the hidden aspects tied to the weapon uh, is, of course, of all beings, Lucifer? Okay, Uh, which, sure, Hellfire and the Underworld and all that. But again, feels like why we need a a Christian devil up in here? I don't know. Why are we just getting the Christian devil? Why is that happening? I don't think we need that. Don't think we do in a game about Greek mythology. We have enough Christian mythos with King Arthur. We're good. We're good. And the the society (laughs) in which we are steeped. Uh, And that, Amanda, is our tour of the Greek underworld and how the game Hades stacks up. Uh, If you're like me, you're probably desperately waiting for this game to come out on any other console besides Switch. And you know I'm probably going to be yelling about it months after everyone else has already beaten it when it finally does come out on a different console. But I'm excited to play it and getting to break down the Greek underworld and talk about it and think about how this game did a fairly good job with a lot of its mythology um, has me really stoked. Yeah, and and I appreciate you giving us the great context. I loved the, you know, snippets of the game that uh, video game correspondent Eric Silver showed me in our home as he was playing it. But if you want to follow him on Twitter and get great uh, video game takes and humor and, and other just general good stuff on your Twitter timeline, he is at EL underscore Silvero. That's his name if he was a Lucha Libre wrestler. So, Amanda, I 
wish everyone a b- the best of luck in trying to escape the underworld as they play Hades, and I hope that they remember to stay creepy and stay cool. Thanks again to our sponsors at functionofbeauty.com slash spirits. You can get 20% off your first hair care order at betterhelp.com slash spirits. You can get 10% off your first month of counseling and at calm.com slash spirits. You can get 40% off a calm premium subscription. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.